Hi everyone. And, uh, is my voice clear to everyone? I guess it's clear, isn't it? Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay, perfect. Okay, so today I will talk about uh, uh, sources of upper voltages in power system. So this is a continuation to the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we talked about normal uh, causes for upper voltages. Normal means like lightning and normal switching. Like for example, when you switch a capacitor back and switch it on. So there is a transients happening in the system, but this is called normal switching. Uh, today we'll talk about abnormal switching, switching that will lead to very high voltages because it happens at certain circumstances. Then I will end up uh, the, uh, the second half of, the, of this notes today. It will be basically about uh, how to protect our equipment from over voltages. So as I said here for normal interruption, for example, the transient recovery voltage, we have seen that that the voltage cannot exceed twice the peak voltage system voltage levels. Okay. Now, when we have an abnormal interruptions in the power system, the voltages can go to much, much higher voltage levels. Now, one difference between lightning and switching, generally speaking, that lightning it does not depend on the voltage level of the system, meaning if a lightning hit a distribution system or a transmission system, the amount of over voltage it will cause, it doesn't depend on the voltage level. On the other hand, most of the switching events, it depends on the voltage level. So if you're doing a switching event at 13.8 uh, kilovolt or at 400 kilovolt, the over voltages will be, will be different. But there are certain types of switchings as we'll see today that does not depend on the system voltage level. Now, why this abnormal interruptions or why we have this huge voltages? This is because there will be like a sudden release of stored energy in the circuit. So this is stored energy could be coming from an inductive part or a capacitive part. Now, when you have this sudden uh, release of this energy, then you will have uh, basically uh, for voltage. Now, we will consider today, because I mean, this is part of a full course about power system transients. So I'm trying to borrow the relevant parts to our course, but without going into too much of details. So we would consider always the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario when we don't have a resistance in the system, because the, the resistance is a damping factor and it would reduce these transients. So every time when we talk about transient over voltages, we ignore the resistive part because it feels it's easier to analyze. And second, this is back considered like the worst case scenario. But if you want to cover this topic from all its aspects, then yes, you need to consider the, the resistance. Now let's talk about the first one here, which is basically a current uh, chopping. You chop the current, this will lead to a very high abnormal transients. Let's see how this happens. So this happens when you have a very powerful circuit breaker. Now the circuit breaker usually they interrupt the current at the zero crossing. So if you have a fault current at the zero crossing, it will interrupt the current. If it fails, then after half a cycle when there is a second uh, zero crossing and so on and so forth. So that is the breaker where it interrupts the current. Okay. Now, however, if we have a small current, very small current and we have a powerful breaker, it might interrupt the current at the peak or at a high value, not at the zero crossing. For example, uh, you have a transformer and this transformer is unloaded or lightly loaded. So you have basically the magnetization current. So if you look to the transformer here, basically, this is the primary circuit. This is the core of the transformer. And here is the secondary. So if the transformer is not at all, it's an open circuit or a very, very light load. So the main current that comes in the primary here basically is your magnetization, the magnetization current. So that is the main current that you have here. So this case happened when the transformer is very lightly loaded, as you will see. 
So this is a typical uh, neural current. The neural current is basically filled with third harmonics because the core, the inductance is because of the pH curve. It is nonlinear inductor. So the current itself will be nonlinear. So what will happen if I come instead of showing the current here, I show the current at, at the peak here. So the current goes now to, to zero. Now, this is a simple model of the transformer at no load conditions. Now we have LM. LM is your uh, magnetization branch of the transformer. This is the coming from the core of the transformer and it is high. Okay. Now R basically is the no load loss because as we know it in the core of the transformer, we have the hysteresis and the ED current losses. Okay. And C is the capacitance the stray capacitor between the winding to the ground. So we have this, this system, and now you come here and you interrupt the current. So you have the energy stored in the inductor, and this energy that's stored in the inductor, once you open the circuit here, you have to basically, uh, you have to release it because it's an inductor, so we have the energy that's stored in inductor is one half Li squared. Now you, ch you chopped the current or you open the circuit when there is a peak current. So there is a current there. This is the stored energy that you have it in your inductor. I zero is the no load current and LM is the inductance of your, of your transformer. Now, because usually the no load current is almost equal to the magnetization current because of the very high resistance of the core. So basically we assume it is almost almost the same thing here. Now, after you chop the, uh, the current, this energy stored has to be dissipated, okay? Now it has two paths, the R and the C. Let's ignore the R. As I said, we always ignore the resistance. So this whole energy, the one half Li squared now will be used to charge the capacitor and the capacitor, as we know, the energy stored in the capacitor is one half CV squared. So this energy will be stored there. And now when you store it, now you are building a voltage. So you have, a, as we know it, the inductor stored the energy in the form of a magnetic field or a current. The capacitor stored the energy in the form of the electric field of a voltage. So when you, when you open the circuit breaker, this current, this magnetic field will be charging the capacitor and it will be starting to build the voltage. We're gonna see how much is that voltage. We'll have one half CV squared is equal to this, because this is the energy now, it becomes now one element, which is the inductor storing the energy. The capacitor will be charged with this energy. This will cancel the half, and then to find the voltage, uh, your voltage is equal to I zero root of L over C. Root L over C is your surge impedance of your transformer. Now, this V now, as you can see, it doesn't depend on the, on the voltage level. It depends on the level of the current you have chopped, but it does not really depend uh, on the voltage level of the transformer. So the transformer is 13.8 kilovolt or uh, 33 kilovolt or 400 kilovolt. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the system voltage level, what matters is only the, uh, the current, the value of the current that you have and uh, basically the uh, surge impedance. Let's have this small example to give you some numerical value. So here we have a distribution transformer 13.8 and 1.5 MVA or 1500 kV. So this is a typical distribution transformer. These rating of transformers, we don't see them much here, but these are the standard transformers used in the, I know the Middle East. Uh, we don't use small ones, that, that the one here, like 15, 20, 30 kVA. There it is 500 and above. Single phase transformer has a no load current of this. So this is your no load current. And it is basically the no load current here. It is in polar format. So it's equal to 1.2 cosine uh, 82 plus G, 1.2 sine 82. So this is your resistive part, and this is your uh, inductive part. So the current will have two parts, resistive and inductive. So this is the part that is 
uh, of my interest. Now, while disconnecting the transformer under no load conditions, the circuit breaker shops. This is the amount of current it shops 1.1 amps. Okay. If the capacitance of the transformer is 2800 picofarad, we want to find what is the over problem. So it's a very straightforward problem. So we need to find first the magnetization current, which is as I've shown to you here. This is the magnet inductive part, that one that goes into the inductive part is equal to 1.188. So basically, when you show current, you show almost the maximum of that current. The current will at, at its peak. Now, to find the inductance, you divide the voltage, the 13.8 kilovolt, divided by the current. So you will get your X, which is equal to omega times L. So from this, you can find L. You divide the reactance by 2 pi F, if the frequency which is 60 hertz. So you get 30.81 Henry. Now we know the capacitance was given to us as 2,800 picofarad. So now just substitute. You find the surge impedance, which is root L over uh, C, and then you can find your voltage, which is equal 121 kilovolt. So you can see here how much is that of our voltage this transformer is only 13.8 kilovolt and because of this shopping of the inner chopping of the of the current i am getting 121 kilovolt even when i test the transformer here this transformer for example as per the iec standard for power frequency we test it at 38 kilovolt for one minute at impulse we test it at 95 kilovolt for the standard 1.2 uh, uh, by uh, 50 microsecond. It, so we don't we never test the transformer for a voltage higher than 95 kilovolt. So such a, a very very high voltage can cause failure to the uh, to the transformer. However, this is the worst case scenario and it never happens. Okay. So in practice, the voltage would never reach such high value. But this is just give you an idea because first we have losses. So the energy that is stored in the inductor, it will be released both in the capacitor and in the in the resistance, resistance winding, in the uh, resistance of the core, and so on and so forth. More important that there's only one fraction of the energy that is trapped at the time of chopping will be released, not the whole energy, not the whole one half Li square, which is stored as a magnetic field. Now, if the current that is chopped at the peak, so if, for example, here you are, uh, this is your normal current, and you are chopping at the peak. Now, this, this is your BH curve. This is your BH here, and H as uh, proportional to the current. Okay, so this is your I. Okay, so if you have, if, if it happens here, Okay, now when, it, when the uh, energy or when it want to, to be charged, it will be charged using the Z path here. So the current will be not, we will not use this, but it will use the path that is was uh, because of the hysteresis, it will just go to this. And then you will have that the energy that under the curve, which is basically this one. This is the energy that is released, uh, which is, much, much less than the QXW, the Q, this is the Q, and this is the X, and this is the total energy. So this is the total energy that is stored in the, in the, in the inductor. This is the total energy, okay? You have only fraction, which is around 30% will be released. The, the rest will stay there in the, in the inductor. So, you're the voltage actually equal to I0, and instead for the whole inductors only 0.3, and this will give me around 55%. So actually not the total 121 kilovolt, only half of it will be applied. And knowing that uh, there will be some also uh, resistance, so the voltage will be, it is high still, it is a high voltage, but it's not as bad as it shows in the, in the calculation. Second abnormal transit we talk about it here is due to the capacitor switching. Okay. As I mentioned last week, capacitor switching is something very common. We switch on and off the capacitor to improve the, the power factor. 
Okay. Now, as we said that the capacitors are basically connected as shunt parallel with the loads, and we keep on changing them because if we if the power factor is low, we need to switch them on. If the power factor now goes up to avoid the problem of going to a leading power factor, we switch them off. And we have seen last week that when I switch on the capacitor, we see that we are introducing high voltage and high frequency. And we said we saw also the impact if I switch to a capacitor, consecutive capacitor, we have seen also what is the impact of that on the system. Now, when we switch off the capacitor, this will result even in a higher voltage and high frequency as well. And we want to understand how this is happening. How, when I switch off the capacitor, my I will have high voltages here. Now, this is also again because of the energy stored in the capacitor. So, when I switch off my system, the capacitor will have high energy stored, and we'll see why we have this. The reason for that. When we open the, the, the breaker, okay, basically, as we know that the breaker, it will basically open when the current at a zero crossing. That is always the breaker action. As uh, in the previous uh, example, we said that it might be able to switch at the peak, but this is only if the current is extremely small and the breaker is very, very strong. It doesn't happen with any break. But the trend, that when your current basically is going through the zero crossing, it will interrupt. Now, I wanna open the breaker to disconnect my, my capacitor here. Now, because this is a merely capacitive load, there is a 90 degree phase shift between the voltage and the current. So when you switch off the capacitor, and this is the current I, the voltage, will be at its peak here. The voltage here will be at the peak because of the 90 degree phase shift. We assume, again, we ignore the resistive here. So we assume the current, uh, the phase shift between the voltage and the current across the capacitor is 90 degree. So the voltage here happens that when I switch is basically at its peak and now the capacitor is not connected to anything. So you are charged to the peak voltage and then you just connect the breaker so the voltage uh, will be would be held inside stored inside the capacitor. So we have a trapped charge inside the capacitor. So here, let's have a look here. So this is my supply. This is my breaker. This is my capacitor bank, and this is the street capacitance, and this is the inductance of the system. So you, this is your VS, the supply voltage here, and you come at this moment here when the current is at the zero crossing, this is your I, you open the breaker, the switch is open. When this is open, this is the voltage across the capacitor. The voltage here will follow the voltage here. So it is at its peak, and now there's some transient having because of the switching, okay? And then the voltage goes down. Now when the voltage goes down, this energy stored in the capacitor has nothing to do. There's no place that it will go. So it will be stored inside the capacitor. Now the voltage will keep going on here. Now here the voltage we have stored here is VC. Okay. Now once this, uh, I mean, it's open, it stays there. Assume there is no any damping happening, so the voltage will stay constant. Now the VC will start to go down here. When it goes down, basically the voltage now across the switch, which is an open circuit, is basically double the voltage. That is the problem. When you have double the voltage, you might have a, a, some re-strike. This open circuit, now you start to have a re-strike because of the very high voltage that start to appear between the two poles of the open. So here is the summary, everything here. So the top trace is the capacitor voltages and the switch open, the voltage is trapped inside the capacitor. The voltage across the source will go now through the cycles, and when it reaches the negative cycle, the voltage becomes double. So the capacity, the circuit breaker, with open circuit, it's not really designed to handle such over over voltage. So reignition, restrike can happen inside 
and this will be connected again. So this will be connected and again and disconnected. And this connected and disconnecting can lead actually to higher and higher voltages to be built up. Now, just I will show it to you mathematically how to analyze the formula, uh, but I omitted most of the uh, the math here because, as I said, uh, we need to, to cover this properly. We need to review all the plus uh, functionality. So I, in the exam, I want to ask you to derive these formulas because this is not the scope, but this is just to give you the feeling of the formula that we uh, derive. So we expect here that once there is the, there is the, the circuit will have an LC circuit. Whenever you have an LC circuit, and here it is obviously, and whenever there is a restrite happens here, it is the inductance of the system and there is the capacitance of the capacitor bank and the straight capacitor. Whenever you have a second order circuit, there will be always oscillations. Always, this is called the second response of the system. So when you open and close, you see always there's these oscillations. These oscillations basically is nothing but the interchange of energy between the capacitor and the inductor. Because of the 180 degree between the two, one will be charging, the other will be discharging at the same time and vice versa. Then you start to have these oscillations. Now, because of the resistance we have, these oscillations will damp eventually. If we don't have a resistance, these oscillations will continue as we will see in the following example. So that is usually the, the frequency that we have of the oscillation is one over two pi root L C and we derived this before. The, now during the restrike, if this is restrike, this apply KVL here. So this is your input voltage, the VM cosine omega T, and VC is the voltage across the capacitor, and LDI DT is the voltage across the inductor. So this is basically just a KVL on the outer loop. Now the capacitor we know it is basically have an initial voltage VC. Okay, and that is now we know that. When the restrike happens, the capacitor has an initial voltage stored in it and integration of the current over 1 over C. Now, if we substitute in the previous equation, this is what we get. Now, if we take the Laplace transform of this, you will get this uh, second, uh, this is the, uh, the, we'll get a second order uh, Laplace equation like this, and your I of S here. Uh, is equal to this. And if you take the blast inverse, this is what I want to show to you. That is your I of T. This is the current that you will have. So here you don't have any damping factor. You have, this is all a big value. And this is sine, and we have omega zero. And this omega zero is basically the, the frequency that one over two, uh, one over root LC. Okay. So if you substitute for omega zero here, so this is the your your formula. And there is no any damping here, so we'll have like an oscillation. But as I said, that's not actually correct because we will have damping due to the, the resistance. And this will represent your voltage across the circuit breaker. Okay, so this, as I said, every strike, now you start to have higher and higher voltage, can reach three, four times, and this can, can continue to strike and restrike. Let's just have an example about these over voltages. So we will have here, uh, suppose we have a 0.6 microfarad capacitor. It's a very simple circuit here. The system voltage level is 15 kilovolt, and the capacitor is a three phase capacitor with a Q equal to 5000 kVr. The capacitive current to be switched when the bank is, uh, is 200 amps, okay? Assume that the source inductance, so the inductance here is one millihenary. If the voltage across the breaker is twice the big value, find the magnitude and frequency of the current. So here the system peak voltage, we go for the peak voltage, you multiply by root two, divide by root three, because this is a three phase system. So when you divide by root three, you get the single phase voltage, multiply by root two. This will give you your basically your peak value. Now the restrike happens. Now the current, your current will be equal to basically double, okay? Because we said it's double uh, times the, this is your, uh, your voltages and you divide by the surge uh, impedance. 
then this is around 6,000, extremely high, and the frequency is also very, uh, very high frequency. So that is just a, a sort here, and as I mentioned before, but in practical situations, the current would not reach these values because of the circuit damping. The last abnormal uh, transient, what is, what is ferro-resonance? What is ferro-resonance? Now, resonance, some, a concept that we know, when you have an inductor and you have a capacitor, could be in parallel, but mainly in series, here it is J omega L, this is minus J over omega C. So this is with a positive, this is with a negative. So at certain frequency, these can cancel each other and become like a short circuit. And this will limit, would, would, would minimize the impedance in the system, which we can lead to many, uh, many practical problems. That is resonance, okay? Now let's talk about Ferro resonance here. So when you say resonance, it's a normal inductor with a capacitor. Ferro here it involves basically the, uh, the. Before that, let's just have a simple example about how much high voltage we'll have during resonance. So your L is a point zero to Henry. The Q factor is to uh, two hundred. You can go back to the uh, slides about the uh, resonance transformers that we use for testing. Uh, you talk about the Q factor there. We want to determine the capacitor necessary to place in the circuit in resonance at 50 hertz. So if there is a capacitor here that will cause resonance, what is the value of that capacitor? And what is the voltage across that capacitor if the system is 11 kilovolt? So omega zero is one over root LC here. This is uh, 50 hertz. Here, the, 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 the resonance, we want to see what is the value of C that will cause resonance at basically 50 hertz. So it is substituted here. Now, from where we get this formula, again, as I mentioned before, let's just go back. This is circuit uh, two, usually we cover this. This is uh, omega L. Uh, this is basically uh, one over omega C. So you want to see when these two are equal. So omega L equal to one over omega C. So if this omega square is equal to one over LC, then omega is equal to one over root LC. So at that frequency, they will have a resonance. Now here we specify the frequency at which we have resonance, which is 50 Hertz. We want to find the value of C. The value of C is 5.506 microfarad. Now at resonance, the voltage at the capacitor is equal to the Q factor times Vs. And the Q factor as we have it is basically is 200. And this will give me how much is the voltage. So it's extremely very hard voltage because of the resonance. Now let's talk about ferro resonance. So the word ferro comes from the word ferrite, which is the core that we use in magnetic circuit. So here we are talking about the uh, uh, resonance that happens between the system capacitance and a core of the transformer. Now, for the resonance to happen, there are certain conditions that has to be there. First, the transformer should be at no load conditions or a very lightly loaded. If the transformer is highly loaded, there will be no, no resonance or fair resonance. There should be, if it's a three-phase transformer, there should be some single phase or sometimes double phase switching. Now, to have the resonance, it is basically a combination of capacitors and inductor. So you have to have a capacitor. Now, these capacitors could be like normal capacitors, like for example, capacitor bank, or could be some stray capacitors, like for example, the cables. So many times the resonance happen between uh, long cables and the transformers. So there will be some matching between the transformer uh, inductance or ferro inductance and the system capacitance so they will cancel each other and this will lead to very high voltage and very high currents now what are the symptoms that come along with the ferro resonance you will have basically an over voltage okay also you have some power quality problems because of the over voltage because of the transient because of the uh, harmonics now here one thing i would like to about the ferro resonance the ferro is a sustained over voltage. 
What does this mean? In the previous uh, cases, the over voltage happened for a short period of time, either lightning or switching, but the fair resonance can stay for minutes. I remember I read one article about talking about fair resonance, and there was one transformer that was subjected to fair resonance, and they only discovered that with that when they see that the paint of the transformer, because of the heat inside, start to peel out. So they realized, so it was around like 50, 60 minutes, something like that, the transformer was under the resonance, and it didn't fail. And so this, so it is a sustained over voltage in the system until the cause for the river, the ferrosis is removed. So this will cause the, of course, when you have such high voltage for a long time, this will cause the damage to the, to the equipment. Uh, this is an example I put from one of the paper. This is shows you the, the waveform of the current. This is a 120 uh, volt RMS is applied here. This will lead to an increase in the voltage by 1.4 volt per unit, and the current is double almost. So the dotted line is the current. So the current is highly distorted, but it, it with a very high value, and the voltage as well is highly distorted, highly uh, nonlinear, and you have uh, high voltage. In three-phase system, the paralysis can happen if you have. Two, now, this has happened with transformer banks and capacitor banks. And when you have like switches that does not open at the same time, if you have a three pole switch, three uh, pole switches, then and you open at the same time, most likely you will not have a ferrosis. But if you have uh, three single switches, you go open one at a time, then this might happen. So here, if we open this switch, this switch. Now you will see there is a path between the system in the between the transformer core and the capacitance through the ground here back. So you will have a full full path. So this capacitance, this inductance of the core, and this capacitor, they are basically are in series, and this can lead to very high voltage. Also, it can happen when you have only a single switch, when you open one single phase only. Again, here you will see that there is a path here that goes between the capacitance. This could be capacitor bank, or it could be capacitance of the cable and the transformer inductance. Once you have this series path, then you will have a problem with the, with the transformer. So I will have like 10 minutes break here. The, now the next last topic we'll talk about how I can protect my equipment from these over voltages, either lightning or switching. Okay, how to deal with this? So this is this will be like after uh, after the break. Uh, hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, okay, so uh, before we start the class, I just want to mention about the final exam. I, I decided for the final exam, it will be three hours, but you will have access to the exam during 24 hours. So the exam, let's say, will start at 8 a.m. You have until 8, 8, 8 a.m. for the next day. So anytime during this, you can you have three continuous hours. You can allocate for that and you can do your exam. Do you have any question about the final exam? I will send an email to everyone to explain that to everyone. But do you have any question or concerns? So this will give you some flexibility when to start the exam. You have the one full day, you can start at any, any, any time. And then you will, of course, once you are done, you will uh, scan it or take a picture of it and you will upload it. Okay, so let's let's start with the second part of our lecture today, which is about uh, protection against over over voltages. We talked about over voltages now for two weeks. We talked about the different uh, sources of over voltages. Now it's very important once we realize that that the system has a lot of over voltages, we need to protect it. It's a, it's actually a, a fact that all these 
switching lightning events will take place. Now, when we decide about protection, economics is is very important factor that we have to uh, to consider uh, for the uh, consequences of the protection system. So it's not practical to do the following: to over insulate each equipment and make it able to withstand these extremely high voltages. That's not practical, that's not economical. Also, it's not also economical to just insulate the equipment against the normal voltages, and if any failures happen, repair or replace. So both these two approaches, they are not justified. Okay. So what we do here, that for every insulation system, it will have certain electrical strength. And this is why we test the equipment, as we mentioned before, for over voltages at far frequency and at higher frequencies. And also we will provide a protect, protective device. Now, what is the objective of the protective device? It will ensure that the voltage that reaches the equipment never exceed the maximum allowed voltages that the equipment can withstand. So, for example, when I see a transformer, it is 95 kilovolt impulse and 38 kilovolt over voltage. The protection system should act in a way that such voltages never happen to the transformer. It's always less than that. So, that is something very important. And I will talk about it in details as we progress. Now we use the installation volt time characteristic. We have shown this before, and I will show it to you today also as well. This is the how to select our protective uh, device. So let's talk about how we, we can uh, general without going into specific. Then later on, we go to the, the specifics. Okay. So basically here we use the uh, time uh, voltage time characteristic here. Okay, and the best way to explain that is as follows. So here you have your equipment, transformers, uh, circuit breaker, cable, whatever, whatever the equipment is. In parallel with it, we have the protective device. We'll talk about the protective device types uh, later on. Okay, and these device has to be to a very close proximity and in parallel. Now let's look here. This is the voltage time characteristic. We mentioned that for our door insulators. Okay. So this is the equipment insulation with a stand curve. So as we mentioned before, at short period of time, stresses like lightning or switches, the equipment can take high voltages. As we increase the time, the amount of voltage it can withstand, it will be less and less. Now, this is what is guaranteed by the manufacturer. The manufacturer actually will tell you that the, my equipment transformer, for example, it is 95 kVL uh, will, will, will stand as an impulse. Okay, so that is the responsibility of the, of the manufacturer. But who will ensure that the transformer will not face any voltage higher than the 95 kV is the utility. And how is that? By installing the protective device that will prevent the voltage to reach even that level. So that devices will ensure that the system will not exceed this voltage. So there is a protection margin between what is allowed in the system and what is the capability of the equipment itself. So that is extremely very, very important so that you will be able to protect your uh, your uh, devices. So how these devices work at normal conditions, these devices usually work as an open circuit or a very, very high impedance. Now, when the equipment sense that there is a very high voltage between here to the ground, the equipment will move from being an open circuit to be a short circuit to allow the surge to go through it here and prevent it from going through the, through the equipment. So that is the basic fundamental 
uh, do that. Now, when while doing this, remember, this will be a huge surge going through the equipment. So the equipment has to be able to absorb the energy without being destroyed. So that protective device, now we have three characteristics. First, at normal operation, which is most of the time, it has to have very high impedance on an open circuit. At high stress, it has to act as a short circuit or a low, very low impedance. And during the conduction of the surge, it should be able to handle the energy, the heat coming from, from this. Now let's talk about the easiest, the simplest mode of uh, protection, which you would call it the arcing horns. Okay, so this is the arcing horns across a string of insulators. We use we used to use them in transformers and basically in other equipment. Let's see how this act and how these three conditions that we mentioned about any surge suppressor should should have. So here, these arcing horns in action. So you have two, basically there are two electrodes. It's a very simple, it's a very cost effective, spaced in air. So it's spaced in such a way that if the voltage between these two electrodes exceeded the designed value, the one that I showed you in the protection curve, it will conduct. So that this high voltage it will not be seen across the insulator. And, and, and as a matter of fact, this will be like a short circuit across it. So it will be like a zero voltage. So you are protecting the device from any, actually any over, uh, any over voltage or over current. And you selected that, we know what is the breakdown of air. So we select the distance between these two electrodes such that uh, it will so for example if this is let's say protection again is 175 kv this is the level of the insulators so we set the gap so that it will this will conduct let's say around 135 kv so there is a margin between when this will conduct and the withstand capability of the of the equipment also this is for transformers pole mounted transformer you, this is in the 80s, we used to use uh, this. However, there are certain disadvantages, problems with this technology, and this is why most of the time you will not see it uh, nowadays in the network. First problem is that after a few discharges, the electrode will need to be changed because this there is some energy. We said it has to withstand the energy, whereas the heat will go. It will cause some sometimes some melting, some damage to the electrode. Remember, these are those arcing horns, they are spread all over the network. To go and change them, that is basically a nightmare. This is something that you don't want to do. Yes, they are not costly uh, as a part, but maintaining them, they are very, very costly. Second, now we said that this relies on the fact that the setting the distance between these two electrodes so that there will be a flash over happens here when the voltage between the high voltage to the ground exceeds a certain value, okay? But however, because this is an outdoor humidity, temperature can influence the breakdown. So for example, you set it to break down, let's say at around uh, 75 kV, but because of the humidity, because of it start to, uh, breakdown or uh, flash over happens between the two electrodes at much lower voltage, like 20, 30 kilovolt. A voltage level that the system should handle it. So then you are sending the wrong messages to the protection system, which is really, really bad. Also, the pollution accumulation here will also impact uh, this. Uh, and all of this will cause uh, a wrong trigger to the protection system, an annoying action to the system. You are interrupting the system as if there is a fault, but there is no fault. So that is the arcing horn. It's an easy technology, but it has several problems. And this is why it's not anymore used or it's used, it's used in a very remote areas. Then the second option is to use what we call non-linear resistor. Instead of just an arcing horns, we use a nonlinear resistor. 
this is generic term. We will see two different materials. They are used for this uh, application. Okay. So we use a nonlinear resistance, and this nonlinear resistance basically it has all these characteristics. It is an open circuit when there is no over voltage. It's a short circuit or an almost short circuit when there is high voltage, and it can dissipate the the energy coming from the arcing. So we need a material that its resistance diminishes very sharply as the voltage starts to build up. Okay. So we have to have this nonlinear material. So the characteristic here is something like this: your current I equal to a constant K V to the power of alpha. So when the voltage exceeds certain value, you will have a very high current it increases exponentially. So that is the characteristic. Now this. Alpha, it depends on the material itself. So, for example, for silicon carbide, it's between two to six. This is the value. So, it has certain nonlinearity, but it's not very high nonlinearity. And the K is basically is the proportional constant here. And again, this is controlled by the geometry of the, of the material. Okay. So one of the major problems of using these nonlinear resistors is that the ceiling voltage after which the, it will start working has a limited to three to four times the normal voltage. Okay, and then the then this will lead to the following that the resistance of the system or a resistor voltage will be very small to the extent that a steady state losses will be large. Okay, so now. You need to have certain linearity, okay? But at normal voltage, you want to have this as almost an open circuit. But because of the limitations in the linearity, then you will have some certain uh, voltage across the material, and then you will have like a steady state losses. And there is a solution for this. Uh, there are two approaches how to solve this problem. The first one is basically to introduce air gaps between these nonlinear materials. This is in the silicon carbide, and we use what we call gap silicon carbide arrestors. So we have silicon carbide, air gap, silicon carbide, air gap, and so on and so forth. And this is the old technology. The newest one, and this is the most basically standard one, is to use a metal oxide, which has much, much higher alpha. Then the nonlinearity becomes extremely high, and you will not have this high voltage that will lead to high uh, high losses. And zinc oxide is the material that we use for for this. So let's have a look first to the basically to the uh, gapped silicon carbide. So this is here. This is your this is your uh, total uh, surge arrestor. This is the high voltage, and this is the ground. This is inside. They are actually they are inside a pushing. So you don't see these things. This is art protected. So you have the SIC silicon carbide material here, blocks, and between them there is an air gap. This air gap will prevent any leakage current to go through the material when you don't have the high the high voltage. So whenever they exceed the voltage, then you start to have sparks. Having in those along with the nonlinearity here, then you will have a conduction of the fault current through the through, through the surge arrestor. Once the the surge arrestor or the uh, over voltage is not there anymore, these air gaps will reseal again, and basically uh, those will go back to their normal high impedance. So those air gaps, they are existing here to, is to basically to uh, avoid uh, any steady state energy dissipation. But as I said, the newly used one is the zinc oxide. So here you have, this is your high voltage here. This is your ground. And so they are like, a, it's, a, it's a pushing outside. Yeah. Here, uh, this is your, uh, the, the, the terminal, uh, Block here. You, these are your terminal block, and this is your uh, metal oxide element. These are metal oxide elements, and these are some heat sinks because of the very high current 
that you will uh, receive, you want to dissipate that, dissipate that. So between the block to the block, there is a heat dissipation element so that it can safely uh, dissipate the heat without damaging the, the equipment. So the zinc oxide is the best performance. This is the standard nonlinear material. We use them in surge as are restored. So the, and we'll see the characteristic in a few slides. So the start give you very, very high current when the voltage exceeds the threshold. And then once the voltage disappears, the current goes back to almost zero value. Uh, another important thing here to talk about is the maximum power frequency continuous operating voltage. So there is certain voltage that the arresters are basically designed to work continuously. We should not actually uh, in, uh, uh, exceed that voltages. So the impedance of the zinc oxide because of the resistors, okay, they are extremely, extremely high that the current will be in milliamp range. A very, very small current. So the steady state losses is extremely small. So because the high nonlinearity here, because the current is extremely small, I don't need to introduce air gaps between the blocks. That is the consequence for that. And as I said here, the energy stored is extremely, uh, the energy dissipated or absorbed is very important because we want to avoid something we call it a thermal runaway. Yes, when the temperature keep on increasing and that can cause to an explosion of the surge arrestor. And this can happen sometimes when the, uh, the material fails thermally, it can explode. And this is why in the housing material, we used to use basically ceramic. Ceramic is the used material for the housing. Now, imagine this is like a, a, an explosion happen inside the ceramic. What will happen to the ceramic material? They are like, it becomes like a pump. Uh, so it is basically very dangerous. So this is why uh, a recent trend now is to use uh, silicon rubber materials at the surge arrestor housing. And if some pump happens, remember this is just a rubber. So it will basically absorb the energy without causing any damages or harm to the surrounding. Now, this is a very interesting uh, characteristic. This is comparing the ZNO or the zinc oxide with the silicon carbide. Okay, so let's look here. So when the voltage, so let's say we talk about this voltage, per this the electric field. So let's say we have here, uh, and one thing you notice here that for the Z in all the characters is is a function of temperature. But I will come, I, I will come to this. So let's talk about let's say fifty degrees centigrade, and you are at this voltage level, one hundred volt per millimeter. Okay, so you'll see here, this is uh, one hundred, and the current that you would have here is 10 to minus 6. But the current here is basically between 1 and 10, maybe around 8. See the difference? This is the steady state currents. Okay. Now, the currents here, if, when the field exceeded the values, becomes nonlinear, you will have very high current. But here, the, you have a very high current in the silicon carbide even at this state, this could be like an acceptable voltage level, okay? Then this would lead to a lot of current here, but the, the high nonlinearity of the ZNO material would make it much better choice, and this is why we don't need the air, the air gap. Now, this is the characteristic of the varistor current versus the varistor voltage. This is the VI characteristic, and let's try to understand this, okay? So here we have three regions. The brief breakdown region, breakdown region, high current region. Now, the brief breakdown region, this region when you don't have any over voltage. So, what you want to have here, you want to have a very, very small current. So, the current here, as you can see, at those voltage levels is extremely small. So, there is no much of losses. Now, once you exceed certain threshold here, then the current start to increase. Now, here, when you have an over voltages due to, uh, it's a power frequency over voltages. This is not 
uh, high frequency. So it is like double the voltage, triple the voltage at best, at, but at power frequency, okay? So that is that region. Now, when you have a switching surge, you have another region here, okay? And that region of the switching, you will have higher current. Higher voltage will lead to high current. But of, of course, now we have to remember that this breakdown region, the time it takes, it's longer, okay? Now, for the very high current region, you see that, or this is for protection against lightning, the current goes to hundreds of thousands of amps, and all of this has to be dissipated, and when this is when the voltage exceeds certain value. If you are here, you don't want to have any current. Ideally, the current's in the milliamp range. If you are here, you are subjected to an over voltage due to the power frequency, so you need basically uh, to uh, limit that, and finally, when you have the items. everything I mentioned in details are described in this in this. All of this is basically I uh, just described it here. You can you can you can look into it here. Now, as I said here, the maximum continuous operating voltage is one of the rating of the surge resistors here, and how much heat is dissipated. So this is the energy capability. Okay, and this is the voltage level of the of the surge array. So this is how much kilojoule joule per kilovolt can be absorbed. This is when you, when you select your your uh, surge arrestor, you have to make sure that you are selecting the the right number. Otherwise, if your surge surge arrestor cannot handle this amount of surge, it can be uh, basically uh, destroyed. The last thing here is how to apply the surge arrestor for the protection. Very similar to the previous, the first slide I mentioned, uh, generally speaking, about any uh, over voltage protection device. Okay. So let's look here. So A is the insulation level of the equipment. So if the equipment without a surge arrestor, let's say uh, this is the in time. So it's applied, for example, this amount for two seconds. This is the amount of voltage it can basically, or it, it, it sees it should be able to withstand that voltage level, okay? Now, the surge arrestor, as you can see, it's characteristic here. It will make sure, this is B. B is the protection level of the surge arrestor. If the voltage reaches that level, would never reach that level because the surge arrestor will suppress that voltage here. And the maximum voltage for two seconds would be this low voltage level. So the equipment can see only this. It will never see that voltage level. And this is why when there, whenever there is a failure happening due to switching or lightning, there is always a problem or a debate between the manufacturer of the equipment if it fails and the utility. The utility will say, is, oh, your equipment, there was a switching or there is lightning and it fails, it shouldn't fail. He said, no, your protection system did not basically prevent an over voltage because whenever there's a lightning, there is no assurance how much the voltage, except if you use the surge arrestor. Myself, one time I was indulged in a big debate with the utility about this. No one agrees about it. The manufacturer says, no, it's not our fault. The utility says, no, it's not our fault. And at the end, they just write some report uh, about, about the case without actually accusing any, anyone, because it's very hard to prove it about if your surge arrestor system was the, has the, the good setting, the right setting, because if you have a, a surge arrestor that work like this, it's no good, because now it will limit the voltage to this level. So maybe the transformer or the equipment, which is supposed not to have more than this, it will have higher voltage levels. So that is, as I said, basically, this is always a debatable issue, and these you could we always keep this margin for protection. Uh, now let's look into it. This is our 138 kV substation. This is the entrance. We have nine units here of the insulator, 138. And then you have uh, circuit breakers. We have surge, we have here a surge arrestor. We have a transformers. Okay. Now these are the, if you look here, description here, curve number one. This number one is basically represent the transformer insulation characteristic. So my transformer, this is the insulation characteristic. 
two, three, and four. Basically, these are the insulation characteristics of the different components here. The, the post insulators, the, uh, the suspension insulators, uh, they are two, three, and four, which is this one. Number five is represent the allowed surge to enter the substation. So this is the surge that can enter the reach the substation. But the surge arrestor, this is number six. It will basically limit. So it, the surge that goes here, it will never reach the dotted line. It will go like here and will be always here. And that level is less than the transformer or, or other equipment. So with this, the surge arrestor will ensure that not no single equipment will be subjected to an over and over. So that is the end of this. Let me stop it.